Next from Chicago, at the annual meeting of the Illinois Association of School Boards, we attend a panel discussion with a group of state legislators on legislative issues impacting school districts and the potential impact on the state's school funding formula should Senate Bill 16 pass. This runs about one hour and 15 minutes. Thank you, uh, Doctor and Calvin. I always heed your advice, so I'm Frank Martino. That's all I got. Thanks. <laughs> It's an honor and privilege to join with you again. I've uh, had the opportunity to speak with uh, many of the groups throughout the years. I'm Frank Martino, and I'm from Spring Valley, Illinois. I serve in the House of Representatives, and the position that I hold is Deputy Majority Leader. And I've done a lot of work with the budgets throughout the year, insurance, educations, and, uh, and appreciate and know the work that's you all do. Didn't start out uh, in the House of Representatives. I come from a family-owned beer distributorship. Actually, Mr. Miranda worked with me there many, many years ago and didn't start out making speeches. I come from an Italian family. He who speaks the loudest usually wins the arguments. <laughs> Martino Distributing Company started in 1904 and never actually stopped. There are some distributors who took a few years off there in the 20s, but my grandfather believed in continuity of service. <laughs> so this is actually the uh, natural progression, right? <laughs> okay. Legislative issues, and I'll start out with some lighthearted uh, stories, but we have some very, very serious issues before the General Assembly. Yesterday, with the ruling on Senate Bill 1, I'm sure every person in this room saw that, and that is the pension. It's a major, major issue. With that being declared unconstitutional, which I did expect, it puts additional pressures and a need for very, very strong negotiations back into the House and the Senate, brings them back to the table. Senate Bill 1 was purported to save about $1.2 billion. Senator uh, Cullerton's bill was about $800 million. Much of that savings and negotiation is put in doubt with that action. So it's basically going back to the table. And that's a very, very big budget pressure. Another one affecting us this year is the change in the interest assumption from the pension boards. Whenever you lower, lower your interest assumptions, the amount the state has to put in, goes up, and in this case, it goes up significantly. The third major piece is that the income tax sunsets and rolls back as of December 31st, which in itself brings down the revenue for this part of the year, $1.2 billion. The interest rate assumption is another $600 million of pressure that gets put on for next year. So there's some very, very heavy decisions that have to be, make, be made along with the changing of an administration. And so hopefully we'll have some good, structured discussions starting out early on. I've had a chance to meet the, um, who I hope will become Governor Rauner's uh, budget person. I have great respect for him. He's a very talented man. If he accepts that position, I think that's a good place to start from. The uh, issue of Senate Bill 16. Anybody hear that one here? <laughs> Maybe. I've got Spring Valley sitting uh, right in here that wins and Putnam County that loses. And it's the same problem that all of the school boards and every representative and senator is gonna have to deal with. Um, when the Senate passed the bill over to us, the House did not call that bill, nor do we intend to call it in the veto session, but it has very, very strong impacts, and it's a discussion that has to happen. All in, we spend and you spend and the Fed spend $26.3 billion on education. In the very, very simplest forms of that, we're educating just under 2 million kids. So just very, very simple and basic. That's a little over 13,000 per child. Well, James Martino in Spring Valley or Gabriel uh, Bradley in Marion, they're not spending 13,000 per child. 
And so the idea behind that bill is a good one about the equity. How do you get there? I have 12 schools that lose. I have 11 that win. The 12 that lose, lose $2.8 million. The 11 that uh, win, gain $5.8 million. And so for that reason, the House has met over the summer. The Democrats, we met as a group in a task force um, structure, and that's how we deal with a lot of our major issues. We bring in the different people from those committees to try and find out what our own position is going to be, because sometimes we're like herding cats. It's a very big, diverse group, a lot of winners and losers, and we can come down on where we want to be. Now this week, we started meeting with the Republican members in a joint committee. Some of the people in this room were there, a few testified. And that's good to hear because it's one of the most important issues that we'll deal with. I know I have overshot my time, but I think those are the issues that you're going to have a lot of questions on, so I wanted to lay those out there. I'm honored to be here. I've been honored to serve you, and I look forward to working with the new administration and with all of you as we continue to try and move Illinois forward. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Martino. Uh, Senator Berrigan? Thanks, Cal. Um, good to see everyone. See some, uh, some friendly faces in the crowd. Hopefully a lot of friendly faces in the crowd. <laughs> Never know when you take the podium and talk about these legislative issues uh, facing our uh, nearly 800 school districts around the state. Um, I thought I would uh, use my time a bit to talk uh, in depth about the least controversial thing that we have facing us, which is a massive rewrite of our funding formula. Uh, some of you know that as SB 16, and I presume uh, that for each of you who has watched this legislation unfold, uh, at this point you probably have a, uh, to say the least, strong opinion on it. Um, SB 16 uh, clearly is a, um, it's a massive rewrite of our funding formula um, that, that I guess I thought maybe I'd start with some of the background of it and where I think it's going and what some of the alternatives would be. And to give it even more context, uh, I sit in the Senate. The Senate has already taken up SB 16. It was a, uh, it was a long uh, process. It was a process that I was engaged in for uh, over a year. And in the end, at the end result, I was one of the no votes on the legislation. I want to explain to you uh, some of the reasons why I oppose that legislation and then also lay out for you some of what I believe are uh, real alternatives that Illinois could enact this year, this coming session, that would um, revise what is clearly an antiquated, inequitable funding formula which we use today. And so, you know, just to walk you through it, uh, spring of 2013, so nearly two years ago, uh, the Senate Republican Caucus released a report called the, an examination of school funding. And that report, some of you may have seen it, that report really laid out what these inequities are. We talked about where nearly $6 billion a year of your taxpayer dollars go and how it is run through the uh, mechanism, which is the school funding formula. I say you send your money to Springfield, we churn it out and we distribute it through this, uh, through this funding formula to our 800 school districts. Most people today do not understand how that works, and I won't even attempt to get into how that works, uh, simply to say that it's a complicated mechanism in which we distribute the dollars. The end result of that distribution is the inequity. School districts, and I know you all, you come from where you come from, but you know about your neighbors and you know of the other school districts that exist around the state, and you probably know the inequities that exist when you look at the dollars that go to this school district versus that one. And you begin to wonder um, why, the, why the formula has, this, has these uh, absurd results that it does. I think much of the reason, and we laid out in our, uh, our analysis of the current funding formula, much of the reason for these inequities stems from the fact that uh, over the last 15 years or so, there have been a series of political decisions made in Springfield designed to fix one thing or another on the baseline 
formula, that baseline formula being a formula that came about in the mid-90s under uh, Governor Edgar. Uh, that is the funding formula that we use today, but each year since the mid-90s, the legislature has done one thing or another to that funding formula to address a concern that has come from our schools. So, you know, think about what all the, those things are. Uh, concerns that come from you regarding early childhood education, poverty, special ed funding, and on and on and on were added to this formula, and it has really created uh, these somewhat absurd results. So, uh, we came out with our report, and soon after, EFAC, the Education Funding Advisory Committee, was established. That committee, which I served on for about a year, uh, was really a great output uh, for state government. We spent roughly one year studying school funding formulas and best practices from around the country. We brought in experts from Massachusetts, Colorado, and elsewhere, and they laid out for us what our alternatives were uh, and allowed us to discuss as legislators what we thought our priorities might be if we were to rewrite the formula. It was a great process. And uh, you, I, I, must, I guess I'd say that I hope state government would do more of this. Look at those best practices around the country and adopt what makes sense here in Illinois. So we go through this year-long study, and it was, it was quite, a pro, quite a great process. But what resulted is where I think we got unhinged. March of this year, so March of 2014, SB 16 came about as a piece of legislation. And, uh, you know, everyone at this point has, has read it or at least understands what SB 16 um, means to you. There are absolutely concepts within SB 16 that I agree with. But I want to talk specifically about some of the things that I disagree with. Here's where SB 16 gets off track. First of all, it's not a bipartisan proposal. There is two political parties in Springfield. One had the opportunity to write all of what was SB 16. The other, I'm a Republican, uh, the other political party was shut out of that process. We weren't allowed input on it. We weren't allowed to amend it. And it is what it is, but that's how it got there. Here's what SB 16 does not address. It doesn't address disparities in how property taxes are assessed in certain areas of Illinois. Makes disparities in per pupil poverty grants remarkably worse. Doesn't contain any mandate relief, a hugely contested topic in that year-long study that we uh, performed. Doesn't address PTEL sufficiently. Doesn't eliminate the Chicago Block Grant. Continues to benefit Chicago public schools by requiring the state to pay the pension payment for the Chicago teachers' pension system. And you know, one of my chief concerns is that SB 16 removes the uh, foundation level, which really is the one benchmark that we have for you to determine whether or not we're doing our job. You measure us based on whether we fund to the foundation level. And you all know that in recent years, we've failed at that. We've failed at it, and the result has been uh, this political concept called a proration. Proration is nothing more than a politically expedient way to say we're not doing our job, we're cutting the amount of money that, is, that we say should be available, the minimum amount of money available to every child throughout the state. And when we can't hit our benchmark, we call it a proration. I think the reason we don't hit our benchmark is because uh, doing so has been a low priority in Springfield. Uh, there's a, you know, everyone understands the uh, financial situation that we are in in Springfield. But think of the fact that over the last 10 years, we have pumped more than $2 billion in increase in education funding of nearly $2 billion over the last 10 years. But even last year, we could not fund <coughs> to the foundation level 100% of the dollars that we say are important to get to our children. That's because the money goes somewhere else through this antiquated funding formula, and it doesn't go to the foundation level. So uh, we can fix this easily. And the way that we can fix it is to simply require 100% funding to the foundation level before any other program or grant line in the education bund budget is funded. That is a very simple thing to do. I'm a sponsor of Senate Bill 3664, which would do just that. Fund the foundation level first. It's a simple fix, 
it guarantees you that there is no more proration, which honestly is the number one concern that I hear from you when I listen to you about what your concerns are. So, SB 3664, no further proration. To me, that's the easy, quick fix that we can do. Unfortunately, that legislation stuck in committee. But even moving forward in the long term, there is a much bigger picture for which I think uh, the Illinois legislature needs to understand. We need to do more than fund the foundation level. And we certainly want to create a, uh, a financial scenario where all of our students have opportunities to achieve at high levels. Uh, I think it's time that we discontinue a reliance on this, these arbitrary budget decisions that happen year after year. Uh, they reflect nothing more than political compromise on our part. Uh, but they in no way reflect our priority on making sure that all of our children, no matter where they go to school, have that opportunity to achieve their highest level of success. I think we need a more strategic approach to funding formulas. Uh, some of you are aware of these evidence-based models that approach funding, form funding our public school districts. What does that mean, evidence-based models? You know, what if I told you that we can identify the environment that our students can be placed in where they will have optimal opportunities to achieve success. We're all, in some fashion, educators who understand what uh, we can measure. And we can measure, and other states have looked to and measured, the environment that we can place our students in where they can have success. I'll give you an example. What if I told you that um, if you're, you know, uh, the grades kindergarten through three are going to have the highest results for our students if they're placed in classrooms with one teacher for every 15 students? If that's true, wouldn't we want our funding formula to create that environment so that the students in that classroom will achieve, have that opportunity to achieve that success? That's what an evidence-based model attempts to achieve. Study the environment that we hope to create for our students. Begin with the end in mind, which is what, op what environment do we want to put our students in, and then create a funding formula that rewards those environments. Think of what that would mean for our 800 school districts around our state. It would mean that the dollars that come to you create incentives to create an environment where your students are going to be as successful as they can be. What a different concept that would be than simply sending your money to Springfield, watching us churn it through the machine, and watching us through what is currently SB 16, simply move money around to create winners and losers based on what appear to be some arbitrary decisions that we make. So I hope that, you know, and Representative Martino talked about SB 16 and where it sits. I hope that we don't move SB 16 in the final weeks of this uh, uh, General Assembly. There's two things that we face in the coming weeks. One is a veto session where I have heard consistently that members of the Democratic Party will not move that bill during veto session. I heard it again today. I think that's good. I also hope that the bill won't move during the lame duck session when we all know that uh, chaos exists in Springfield during lame, lame duck sessions, to say the least, chaos. <laughs> what I hope is that, and you, everyone I'm sure has their opinion on the governor's race, but regardless of your opinion on governor-elect Ronner, know that the dynamic in Springfield shifts come mid-January of next year. Suddenly, rather than all the levers of our state government being operated by one political party, come mid-January, there's going to be a balance in Springfield that is necessary if we're going to work together as the two political parties on this issue and all the other major issues facing our education community and the people and taxpayers of Illinois at large. So I hope that come mid-January, uh, you will all begin to see some of that balance play out. And if it does, I think we're going to fix things like our funding formula and other things in a bipartisan fashion in a way that is helpful to all of our uh, school districts around the state and ultimately give all of our children uh, the opportunities that they deserve. So thank you.
Thank you, Mayor Bergman. Uh, thank you, Senator Berkman. Now we have uh, Senator Bertino Turan, 49th District. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. Um, it wasn't too long ago that I was on the other side, eagerly uh, waiting to hear what was going to be told uh, to us. I get often asked, do you, as, I, as uh, Cal said, I am a former educator, I was a teacher, I was a school principal, last I was the regional superintendent, and uh, people often ask me, do you prefer being called doctor or senator? And I always tell them, well, at least with doctor, people believe I have a potential to help. Uh, with senator, they believe I have a potential to hurt. So, um, um, many things were said here today, and I don't want it to become a, um, a, a partisan uh, conversation here. So I know Senate Bill 16 is on everyone's mind. I did support Senate Bill 16 and uh, like my uh, Democratic colleague across the chamber, um, I have what we call winners and losers. So it was not an easy, easy decision. Um, I have had, been engaged in numerous conversations and as with anything, the conversation has, uh, it has evolved. And Senate Bill 16 and your concerns have not fallen on deaf ears. Uh, people will say, yeah, we voted for it, but we knew the conversation was going to go on. And I don't think that's a fair, a fair approach to take. And I was just telling uh, 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 my friend Kurt um, Bradshaw that that is not a, a fair thing to say because as school districts, we know how often uh, each year we're inundated with new things that we have to do so having this uh, conversation knowing that it was going to keep continue to move forward is, is a still, still a scary thing for schools but um, you mentioned uh, my colleague mentioned former governor Edgar and I want to take a quote from him and I'm not saying I agree or disagree with this quote but he they had uh, he was advanced Illinois we're all familiar with advanced Illinois he is a, a member of that and he says uh, regarding Senate bill 16 Sorry, this is what's happened. I, I finally have come to this. So, um, Senator President, you help the poorer school districts. The wealthier school districts don't need the help, he said. he said. That means the property taxpayers are going to carry the load more. But the feeling is they're in a better position to do that. Okay, and so that's, so this is not just a partisan issue. And I'm not saying I agree with that statement, but I don't want it to, Thought, the thought process to be this was a democratic process coming up with a democratic idea. Um, Senate Bill 16, the concept is supported by many people. And I do not think we could deny that equity for education should be our key focus. As I said, uh, I have winners and losers. My kids' school district is going to lose 67%. I was at the school, my, uh, the school board, and of course, you know, um, they look at me and say, Jennifer, how can you do that to us? Um, we have all these wonderful programs. We don't want to cut them. And I say, I understand that. I don't want you to cut them either. But when my child can get things that someone else's child can't get, I have a hard time with that. And I share this story for, for people who have listened to me, where you know I, I sat with Andy Menard, who was a sponsor, numerous, numerous times, as she's trying to convince me this is a good thing. And it was just kind of that aha moment when I was sitting with him, and I share that my office is filled with my students' artwork from school. His office is filled with his students' artwork, or his child, children's artwork from schools. And I said, student, my kids. Um, and we got to talk about the programs we have, art, music, PE. We're very fortunate. And he asked, how often do your kids have art? I said, a couple times a week. Do they have it every year? Yes. My kids get art once a week, not, not even once a week. He gave it once every few weeks, every other year. And it was just kind of that, that moment that I said, that's not right. These are important, whether or not they're the, you know, we, we are denying kids some of the, the, the greatest thing that helped mold them as human beings. So I know I, I take an emotional approach to this. And while there are definitely aspects to this that need to be approved, I, I'm not denying that. I know the conversation. I disagree with, uh, respectfully disagree with my, my colleague, uh, Senator Bergman, that things are not addressed. I agree we need to still address PTEL. We still need to address 
mandates. I have a bill out there too, it's Senate Bill 3662 that does address, me, uh, that we're working on addressing mandates. I disagree that it is going to fund the Chicago teacher pensions and I do think it is addressed the Chicago block grant. Um, we gave a number of new dollars that are coming into schools or to education system, and they're not trickling down to the schools. And that's because it's going to support PTEL and, and the grant. So things need to be worked on. Moving forward though, just so you know, uh, there has been conversation. I'm gonna share some of the things I'm hearing. So this is not, these are some of the things I'm hearing in regards to changes to Senate Bill 16. And again, I'm stressing what my colleague said. I've been repeatedly told it's not going to be called in veto session. I have faith in the sponsor that it's not going to be called as is. In case it is, it's not, but uh, Senator Katowski, <laughs> Senator Katowski filed Senate Bill 3673, which holds districts harmless, so dollars will not change. So that's uh, Senate Bill 3673. He just did that uh, November 19th. Some of the changes I am hearing that we need to address, obviously outlying districts are losing money. Sponsors have indicated an interest in addressing those issues. Special education fund was eliminated. We're going to interest in addressing those issues and also um, sponsors have indicated they're very interested in addressing ways to account for cost of living in the suburbs the suburb that factor the overall formula so these are conversations that we are planning to take moving moving forward um, again you know being in your shoes for many years um, I, I know it's it's a hard it's a hard thing uh, to listen to us and, and have faith um, but I, I tell this to we, we have a new, for lack of a better, a new generation. There was a lot of turnover in the last few years. And I truly believe on both sides of the aisle, people are there for the right reason. They want to engage their constituents. They want to listen. So we need it to be a mutual conversation. Um, I hope people in my area recognize that I am visible, I want to hear them, and I take their concerns back to Springfield. Like I said, this is, this is why I'm here. Education is, is why I'm here. And I really have the schools, the children, the teachers in my best interest at all time. Do not hesitate ever, ever to call me and reach out. Communicate with your senators, representatives. They do listen. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator. And now we conclude with uh, Dr. Cook. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Cook, your state superintendent. This morning, I'd rather be a beer, beer distributor. Um, it's a great life. It, only imagine what that would do to the conversation. So. Um, so I thought I'd be telling you, uh, so I've had the privilege of being with the State Board. Incidentally, we have several State Board members here. I wanted to recognize Dr. David Fields, Dr. Andrew Brown, Kurt Bradshaw, Melinda Labar. If you don't like what I say, see them. Uh, Robert Wolf, also on Deb Vespa on our staff. I wanted to recognize them. Um, I wanted to tell you one of the privileges of being on the State Board is that we've had a student advisory council. It sounds like I'm not going to talk about anything in the topic, but I am. It's going to come around to it. These are uh, primarily juniors and seniors from all over the state, but also we get some sophomores. And every year they come together and they develop a project and demonstrate then and make recommendations for policy changes in the state of Illinois. And almost every year, without fail, something about what they present demonstrates inequities. So one year, I remember sitting in state board meetings and here the students brought up the differences in their school buildings, the physical buildings of where they went to classes. And you had pictures of the state-of-the-art facilities of chemistry labs that you wouldn't, would see on college campuses, and other kids who were basically had no lab equipment, none at all, none. Some of them have spacious gymnasiums, great places to go and recreate, and others had nothing, right? And even Thursday, when I met with our most recent Student Advisory Council members, they said to me, some of them were in classes that other ones couldn't even realize were available. One student said, and pointed across the room and said, that student has 11 AP courses and I have none, right? So this is the viewpoint 
that is important for all of us to think about. Because I guarantee you, while there are winners and losers with Senate Bill 16, there are winners and losers now in a big way. And we see that up close and personal in part because we intervene on behalf of districts. We try to provide financial oversight when they're failing. And it's very hard work. But it requires all of us as adults to be thinking about what's in the best interest of all children in the state. And our Constitution that all of us swore to uphold requires not just a public education for kids, but a high quality public education. And that's something that we're not meeting right now. And I think the good news in this conversation is that we are in agreement with that. We've just come through a terrible recession where all the blemishes in our funding formula became very apparent. We have things in the formula that are antiquated that were put there a long time ago. We should be revisiting this formula. And while the State Board believes Senate Bill 16 currently isn't perfect, and we think there needs to be changes to it before this is passed, and we also think additional time and study needs to take place, thank heavens, folks, we're having this conversation and that you care about it. And my staff and I have gone to some of the wealthy suburbs. We've gone at every invitation from Republicans and Democrats uh, to talk about this issue. It is a bipartisan issue. One way or another, if we fail to educate kids, we pay for it in a big way. The earlier we can intervene on behalf of kids and their learning, the better policy decision and better direction. There is no question about that. No question but we do need to give this further study. We do something called a property tax extension limitation where basically, and I think you all understand this, but basically the difference there is that a county may cap their taxes and then the state pays the difference. No other state in the country does it. No other state in the union does it. There's not such a reliance on property tax as here and we could find nothing that looks like that anywhere else. Those are things that need to change. Currently, we equalize 45% of our funding, and through Senate Bill 16, that jumps to 82% of funding. We, let's talk a little bit about adequacy. We've had in statute for a number of years an Education Funding Advisory Board whose job it was to come up with a amount of money that the State Board every year, as we do our budget compilation, determines as to what's adequate for education. We are billions away from meeting that number. And there has never been any criticism of the methodology in used in that. We, we proposed, and there was testimony at the hearings, for uh, National Lewis's model of evidence-based. And I think that's great, and I think that model has a lot of promise. But I bet you it's still going to show we're not adequately funding public education. There's debates around our ranking. So we rank 48th, 49th in terms of state funding. And there's counter evidence that was presented at some of the hearings around, yeah, but if you take in local proceeds. But the problem with that, taking in local proceeds to determine where we rank, is that it matters where you live. And not everybody lives in the same place. So some equalization is so terribly important to talk about in terms of the formula. It really is. The State Board came up with principles prior to the work of the Senate Committee, and I commend the Senate Bipartisan Committee. Those were thoughtful discussions and people, they did a great job. Adequacy was number one. That's what the State Board said we had to be looking at. Simplicity, transparency, equity, and outcome-based focus. People care a lot about that. A lot of these hearings I've attended, people have talked about outcomes. Now there's something else I want to talk about. This won't be very popular. So get your tomatoes ready. <laughs> So we have a very unique arrangement in Illinois of having elementary and high school districts. And we actually financially incent elementary and high school districts separately. So that if you have these separate districts, you have a greater possibility to tax than a unit district. Now let me just tell you, that doesn't work in the interest of kids in teaching and learning. There's no reason for that. Most states don't do that. That leads to a lack of continuity in curriculum. It leads to 17, in some cases, or more elementary feeder schools going into a high school. And you wonder why, uh, why I support common standards. 
We had kids coming in, some who've had algebra, some who haven't. Uh, it makes it very difficult and disjointed to educate and, and to provide teaching and learning to kids. Let's think about, when we do our formula, of incenting structures that we want for our kids and that make sense. And I realized that might mean some adults might have to lose jobs in that process. But let's think about what's best for students in teaching and learning. I'm not saying there should be mandated consolidation or county districts in the state of Illinois, but we should be thinking about arrangements for teaching and learning that matter, and we should at least be incenting us to do the right thing. I can tell you in eight years, I have had hundreds of local superintendents who have come up to me and said, Chris, we desperately need a regional high school in this area of the state. We can't provide the courses kids need. We can't recruit the faculty that need to teach them. We just can't do it. We desperately need it. But we've got to have you tell us that and make us do it, because we're never going to agree to do it locally. But what's best for students? What is best for students? So I hope, in, in my dream for this formula, whether I'm here or not, is that we do get to that conversation and that we're incenting the right things and that we're having honest conversations about what that means for kids. That would be my dream for the state. I want to thank all of you who are so committed, I know, every day, and I know how hard it is not to know the dollars that you're going to have to work with ever from the state. I get panic calls. I can't tell you how many thousands of calls and requests the State Board has received begging us, please tell us what we're going to have to work with for this school year. We don't have a clue. Are you going to cut? Are we going to have to lay off more staff? And we proactively every year lay off personnel all across the state. Do you think that's not hurting teaching and learning in the state? Of course it is. You need to be able to predict and anticipate money for funding. You, you are owed that by the state. That is in the public good. And we should be figuring out how to do that in a better way when we redo the funding formula. That's absolutely necessary. No business would run on those premises of not knowing of not knowing. You should be able to plan and anticipate. And I feel very bad every year that we've not been able to provide that for you. So hopefully we can address those kinds of things. But I want to thank you for your work on behalf of students, because I know you care about students, and I know you struggle every day with a lot of ambiguity, a lot of mandates. I'm sure we'll hear about that. But I really do appreciate what you're doing. And know it's so important. It's so, so very important. And that all kids matter. They all matter. And if one kid fails in this state, it impacts all of us negatively, without a doubt. So thank you for your leadership and courage. Thank you. Um, I'm Cecilia O'Brien from Moline, Illinois. I border Iowa, our district borders Iowa with the Great Mississippi between us. It's a tale of two cities, Moline versus Davenport. Iowa's funding is completely different than Illinois'. I work for a large national corporation, and when managers come in from other areas, they move to Iowa. The district over there is no better than ours, but they move to Iowa. Will you have the courage to change the way things are done so that I don't have to see people cross the river instead of living in my district, which I know is a good school district? Will you change the way things are done? Iowa does not use property taxes. We have high property taxes. They don't want to live in Moline because of the rate of the taxes for property there versus Iowa. Please, will you have the courage to do something about this? If you don't believe me, come visit me and you can watch them crossing the bridge. I think that, that you are going to see um, some changes in the formula. One, because it's going to be forced to happen. And in the cooperation itself, the simple reality is a month from now, we drop by $1.2 billion. Had this year's appropriation not put an extra $80 million, your proration would not be at 89%. It would have been the 70s, and many of my schools would have closed. So we are sitting at a time where you're going to have a balance, which is out there, some forced negotiation, and some reality that there's going to need to be additional revenue. That is a reality. You know, campaigns are over now. The reality is 1.2 billion to 1.8 billion this year and 6 billion next year when you fully annualize it. I would work a lot with the budgets. So we're in a situation where we'll have to do that as well as addressing 
the old bills and the three things that actually keep the state from fully gaining where it needs to be. One is you've got to get the old bills paid down. We paid down six billion. If the tax goes completely away, that leaves the option of proration by him or allowing those old bills to rise. You've got a forcing of negotiations and things that have to happen in the short term. So yes, I'm committed to do that. I think that the new administration has picked some financial people who I met the other day that I think are pretty decent and sharp, and so I'm very hopeful. And yes, I will vote that way. Uh, that back, yes, okay. I'll just get. <laughs> no, I, I just want to make a, a brief comment that um, I think there is a, a strong desire in the legislature to see a mechanism which results in a lowering of our property taxes and less of a reliance in our school districts on property taxes. The, the question for taxpayers is, you know, how do we restore their confidence that if we're going to ask them for more of their money through Springfield, that they have the confidence that those dollars are going to go in an effective and an efficient manner towards the purpose that we want them to and not just funnel through this arbitrary funding model that we, sh that we all know results in disparity and inequity throughout our state. Restoring that confidence in the taxpayers, I think, has to happen before we get to the question of let, can we take more of your money? Again with it. So uh, the question was challenging the State Board of Education's advocacy for, edu for education dollars was one, and then also challenging the mandates that come from the state. Is that, ac is that basically the, the unfunded mandates? Well, so, okay, so first let me correct you on one thing. First of all, the state board, uh, so you understand our obligations, every year compiles and every year after hearings across the state, uh, state budget and give a recommended budget to the Governor General Assembly in January. We are doing that now. In fact, we concluded our last hearing yesterday in Chicago. Every year that has been for more money than has passed, finally. Uh, last year was a billion more dollars. So. Make no mistake about it, the State Board has been advocating for more funding for education. Uh, because you don't see it doesn't mean that we're not advocating for it. Uh, we, we think that that is very important. We, we have taken a position last year that we should at least be funding 6119. For every percent of proration, that's $50 million. So for us to close the gap in proration for next year, and we'll be putting a budget, please watch, a budget to, uh, together and submitted in January, uh, that'll cost 550 million just to do that. That doesn't include the testimony we heard around early childhood. That doesn't include the mandated categorical payments uh, and all the money needed there. So all of those things are very much in our mind as we compile the budget. And we also take in uh, the revenue. We have a presentation to the board every year on, on re anticipated revenue that would be coming in. And we also uh, take into consideration the Education Funding Advisory Board recommendation and make that known when I give my testimony to both the House and Senate Appropriation Committee. So uh, we have done that. Uh, and I think that is a very important point to raise and to keep raising. Uh, the, um, so the, your second part of the question, again, I'm not quite clear, un unfunded mandates, is that basically it? Well, first of all, we, we've, uh, we have not supported, in its current form, Senate Bill 16, we think needs to be changed. We, I laid out several amendments that we think needs to occur before that bill would be passed by the State Board or, or a proponent of it. So the State Board has not been in agreement uh, on Senate Bill 16 in the current form, but we have some specific recommendations around what would make that better. And certainly, uh, some of the recommendations around tax fairness would, I think, lend themselves towards that. So that's our position. The question is, uh, with, the, with the decision by the court yesterday, how, how about cost shift? Okay. 
You all break. know what cost shift is, right? Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as far as the um, cough shift, I do not see that passing, um, and here's why. The, uh, the issue has come up um, within the districts. The question is Chicago funds theirs, and the downstate TRS, that's about $800 million a year, uh, that goes towards the funding of that pension system. With that decision, there may be discussions of a cost shift, but the reality is the proration has caused about two-thirds of the district downstate and the suburban areas to be operating in deficit, and that number will rise. Although transportation has had dollars um, placed back into it, it is still at less than half the level of what it was merely a few years ago. So with those pressures placed on, I do not, um, politically, either party, seeing votes being put on to bring that portion of the cost back to the districts. That's a reality that I don't think will occur. There'll be a lot of discussion of it. There'll be a discussion of picking up the city of Chicago's, since they pay that through their property tax structure, that 400 million. Um, those come out, but without addressing the proration issue, which on its own is 550 million and the transportation cost, which has a bigger impact the further downstate you move, the votes aren't there. I'll just add a little bit uh, on that as well. Um, obviously, in, in the suburbs, the, the collar counties, that would be a pretty uh, detrimental added on to Senate Bill 16 here. Um, however, if in individual conversations, as, as it was mentioned, I, I've been the Will County, I was Will County Superintendent for, for six years. So this conversation has been ongoing. This has been a concern, and it has been talked about. And you get differing opinions whether or not it was gradually brought in, whether or not uh, districts could uh, sustain that. Um, I agree again with uh, Representative Martino that it would be a hard sell in the suburbs. However. And this is just me thinking out loud, so don't get panicked here. Um, coupled cost shift with that do those dollars saved being put back into the system and dedicated to education via law, we may be able to see some of that that 100 for be able to get to that 100 percent. We know we need revenue. We know we need revenue, and how we're going to get it uh, when we talk about without hurting our property taxes and, and uh, fees and things along that line. Um, there has to be some ingenuity here. And again, that's just my little wheels turning there. But um, in and of itself, cost shift in the suburbs will be a hard sell. Uh, Ron, just a second. Uh, I, we've been talking about cost shift for probably about four years and every time the conversation came up i said well the assumption i make is we're going to be authorized to levy a tax outside tax caps to pay for it if not we're going to have to reduce class size or in increase class size and reduce staff to pay for it you yeah. know anyhow there's consequences that ron you have a question for yes my name is ron savage i live in center park And one of the biggest things I see was the extra expenses the trucking company has incurred in the last eight, nine, ten years. The next thing, I think if the state would ever listen to small business, we need business in the state of Illinois, and we're noted to be one of the worst business community in the United States. And you can't get business if they go other states, Indiana or Missouri, because the taxes are lower. And believe me, I understand that in the trucking industry. That's number one. Number two is, my question is, when the lottery was, was decided on about 25 years ago. And then we get back and we're going to say, okay, that's going towards education. Where has it ever went? So that's the question. Where is the lottery money? <laughs> okay, I'll start out and everyone join in. The lottery um, actually wasn't started for education. It originally was started by a man from Rockford by the name of Zeke Georgie. It was the funding mechanism for the RTA. And then after that was created, it then was switched over to funding for schools. In reality, it, um, it generates about $600 million a year. 
and that does go directly into the overall budget. Chris, your last year budget elementary secondary was total. So state, yeah, totals nine billion, three billion is nine billion. So that does help and assist. And the lottery numbers have actually gone down as gambling expands in other areas on the casino side. I think the last uh, ladder, uh, the last lottery numbers were off um, about 15 or 20 percent. So it does help, and it does go where it's supposed to. But that's it kicks in as part to the nine billion dollar portion of the state. Didn't they also sell that? Of course, was it a private industry? Yeah. Yes, they have a private manager uh, in it right now, and actually the dollars from lottery are are coming up from that more than more than what we have produced managing it ourselves. They haven't hit their target goals yet, but they're still producing more money as a private manager. You're asking about the mandate of Common Core? Yes. So thanks for bringing that up. Uh, <laughs> let me speak on mandate. So the question, so you all heard, there was, a, 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 there was several pieces to this I want to address. One was around the mandates. and. And just know in the task forces that have been held in the General Assembly and all the discussions on mandates and on our efforts to remove one big costly one uh, that failed uh, this past year, there are four that always reach the top as costing the most. Special ed, class size restrictions, driver's ed, PE, and third party contracting, right? And they all come with a huge constituency and it makes, so if these guys go to change any of that, they hear from a lot of people who care about them. We attempted to address special ed class size of the state board. It was some of the most attended board meetings we've ever had, and people were sure that we were going to be killing their children. So that is, these are, people care about these, and they come with constituencies. You just have to know that. Um, let me say a bit about the, the uh, Common Core learning standards. Uh, I believe these are good, and they're good for the state, and they're good for kids. Why? Because they are internationally benchmarked, and we have to be honest about what our kids need to know and be able to do in this economy for them looking forward. And it makes incredible logical sense, given the mobility of our families that we now have, not just in Illinois but across this country, that what a third grader is receiving in math in one state, when they move across the border, would be the same thing in another state. It also makes sense to military families who are very mobile and who have been outspoken supporters of having these learning standards uh, that are meaningful and that re reached across uh, across borders. So I think they're good. They're going to require. We have heard for years about the importance of higher order thinking skills and critical thinking for students. These standards require them. Our students should know them, and they should be taught in part of instruction. They are our Illinois learning standards. We also have looked at PE. We have implemented new PE standards. Uh, we are looking currently at social studies and art. We're not just looking uh, myopically at, at two sets of standards. We looked at science. Many states are now sharing the same science standards. These are all important, and it's part of the duty and obligation of the State Board to make sure those expectations are real. I'll just um, touch on the, on the mandates issue. And uh, to give you some perspective of what um, this conversation is like in Springfield, at least last year, in the Education Committee, we spent uh, a huge amount of time during one of our hearings considering a significant mandate relief proposal that would allow local districts to make their own decisions on the mandates for which they wish to opt out of. A proposal that I thought was a good first step, letting you make decisions locally. We spent hours on that, and it failed. And the next piece of legislation was a new mandate. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> but what I what I hope again, you know, as we move into uh, 2015, my hope is that again, if the parties are working together and we're working together on a new funding formula, part of that formula would certainly have to include a hold, hold harmless provision, and in the spirit of trying to find ways to allow you to be more efficient with every dollar we send to you, we ought to be looking for opportunities to relax some of those mandates so even 
though a district may receive less money from the state, they'll be more flexible in how they spend their dollars and they'll get more bang for their buck. And it would seem as though, um, as, as we face the reality of Illinois' financial decisions, we ought to be considering more of these methods in which we give you, as a school district, more flexibility so that even if there's less money, you can use it in a better way. So in case you didn't hear the question, it was the uh, overwhelming uh, uh, concern around park, which we're hearing a lot about. So the, so that, uh, just to, I want to bring everyone up to speed. I'm not sure how much folks know about. Uh, there are two uh, consortia assessments that were paid for by the U.S. Department of Ed, one being the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness in College and Careers, which is known as PARC, the other one being Smarter Balanced. Both are aligned to the new learning standards in English and math. Both require the demonstration of critical thinking skills. And there's been a number of concerns, and I'll keep Chicago separate from their concerns right now of what, uh, with, with the assessment. But another one is, is that uh, time. We have a culture here in Illinois of ACT. ACT is known by colleges and accepted by higher ed. I'm just going to repeat because I can give you all the arguments. I've had a million conversations on this. Uh, and so why are we doing another one? Uh, so here's what we all need to understand. One is that we are required by federal law in exchange for receiving title dollars to give an assessment grades three through eight and one in high school. And as we were laying out the plan for assessment, there actually are more assessments available than Illinois is currently using in rolling this out this year and having it after uh, uh, Algebra 2 and English 3, uh, which usually falls on the junior year but doesn't have to. In high school, the assessment is end of course, so eventually it could be used as a final exam, for example, at the end of the course. Um, the, some of the criticism is around a lot of school districts are using a lot of different assessments. I think the suggestion was, why don't you let us use the assessments that we can? Um, so we have to have a assessment for accountability. We can't have, uh, for example, a menu of assessments uh, and, and be accepted in terms of meeting the federal requirements of the law. So we couldn't offer you a menu, for example, of do this or this, although that has been a suggestion, particularly at the high school this year. Um, so that's why we're giving one, that's why it's the park. Now, I do think it's important for assessments, the evolution you're seeing here of assessments and the direction they're going, this is the right direction. It takes more time because you're asking, asking students to demonstrate they actually know material. You can go online now, I encourage you to do so, look at the third grade practice test, and it's probably different than the kinds of tests we were taking. You're no longer sitting down and doing a multiple choice answer of one or four. You've got to really know the material. Now, why is this important? Well, that's because it, the, the more that you are familiar with this uh, uh, content, the better you're going to be able to perform in actually using it. And it's taking us towards uh, the application of knowledge and skills. So assessing that is more time consuming. It's still, the state assessment is still less than 1% of the entire instructional time in a school year. But the reality is there's a lot of other assessments that school districts are using. Even ACT, which is paid for by the state, is no longer mandated, yet most schools are using it. But it is a different purpose. It is really designed as a sorting, a sorting assessment. So. Oh, I, one other thing I want to say about PARC. It, it's designed to tell you whether or not students need remedial coursework, which education has been badgered about for a long time from higher ed about the amount of money that's spent when students transition into community colleges and four-year institutions, thus having to retake coursework. The goal is to try to get that addressed before they go into community colleges or four-year institutions, if that's where they're going, so that you don't have to pay for that again, and there would be acceptance around those courses. So that would be a huge cost savings if, in fact, it's realized. I, I represent a district that is um, uh, about six counties large, uh, roughly 35 or 40 school districts. I grew up Woodland. Uh, some of the <laughs> <Whew>. <laughs> you never know who's in the audience. You know, I, I think I, I think we all understand the um, the. the well, hopefully, we all understand the pressure that is put on our school districts through the current reimbursement model. Hopefully, as you know, again, it, it, if we look in the big picture, and the big picture suggests we're going to do something on school funding, 
as part of that, if we skip stick to some of the principles that you know that I've tried to outline here, such as um, providing to you, you know, the the dollars that need to be there to get your kids to school and to educate them in the best environment possible, um, with the most flexibility given to the school districts to spend those dollars how they best see fit. I think if we get there, that helps address some of the. Uh, the concerns that many districts have today on how we go about our transportation reimbursement and the limit again these are just political calculations you know and political compromise results in today's model that has you know so many dollars being made available through the uh, through for transportation funds it's a political decision year after year how much are we going to cut transportation to solve the bigger uh, you know budget picture and again big picture as we move to next year and maybe a new funding formula I think we can address some of that through that just real real briefly in answer to the question Senate bill 16 does have three structures of the transportation formula first is regular transportation which is a on-the-nose per pupil um, structure for those districts where the further you go down state, the bigger the districts are, the more miles. There's extraordinary transportation, which is an extra weighting factor, which would go in for those districts that have, you know, I've got areas where they run 200 miles, you know, so they would get that. And then in our area, what is also uh, very big, tied to the folks from Woodland too, um, is vocational. We have area vocational centers, and so vocational transportation would also receive an extra weight. The amount of those weights are what will be negotiated, but yes, we're trying to get away from the, the geographic ring. So this formula does have three components, and then from that, we'll decide what the uh, appropriate rate would be. So you're wanting to know about expansion of charter schools? or? privatizing that type of thing I serve on the subcommittee of charter schools and um, in the, the two years I have been there we repeatedly see uh, charter school initiatives come about um, depending on where you're at is whether or not uh, charter schools are a big focus I, I live in Will County I represent Will in Kendall and we have not seen uh, search what we are seeing is and this is the reality and I, I, I hope I'm not misspeaking is we're dealing with the charter school system that are really coming into Chicago and since Chicago does not have an elected school board we deal with all the issues there um, as, as you mentioned I, I am uh, I had the, the privilege of talking to Governor Rauner he, um, you know we talked about education uh, he said that is a priority I said great we'll get along fabulously um, he said he wants to make it his number one priority and he is determined to uh, make Illinois the best schools in the state or in the country. And I said again, great, we're on the same page. How we get there may look a little different. I am a, a staunch supporter of public education and very rarely will you see me support a charter school initiative. However, um, however, you know, there are, there are needs for them. So um, I, I do understand and recognize there are, are needs for them. I think right now you have a, a, a caucus that is, is hesitant, and I, 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 talk, I should say this, you know, down in the collar counties down south a little bit. Um, They're hesitant to see, them, to see them expand. So it is, a, it is something that we see regularly. Um, again, um, I think the, the precedent has been, what are you doing different? We don't need to see charter schools develop. They're doing the same thing the public schools are doing, except don't have to follow any rules. So that's what we are focusing on. Uh, Steve? I'm Steve Westrick from uh, Odin 722 down in Southern Illinois. I'm president for Senator Barrickman. In your, uh, your results-oriented model, my school district wouldn't have the extra classrooms necessary to have the class size that you mentioned. Are you going to be in favor of construction grants to help us build those extra classrooms? Yeah, you know, good question. You know, the question is, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the question is, you know, if you change the funding model to encourage different classroom environments, are the dollars going to be there to create, construct, or otherwise, those classrooms? 
And the answer is, I mean, from my opinion, the answer is yes. And we, uh, you know, I, I believe that we will uh, look to a capital bill in the coming year or more. Um, but we're going to look for opportunities uh, to build in Illinois. And I think we need to target some of those dollars to the school districts that with this new formula, of course, uh, could have the physical uh, environment that they need for those classrooms. So yes. Yeah. Question about, has there been discussion about expanding the sales tax base? Uh, short answer to that is yes. Uh, for the past year, the, um, the House Revenue Committee has met with the State Government Committee, both uh, sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans. They have looked at uh, the sales tax. I was part of that section that did that. We've also looked at the business incentives that we offer and at TIF and Enterprise Zones as the funding legs um, that, are out, uh, that are out there. So yes, there are a number of areas that the governor-elect has said he'd be willing to look at. Uh, in expansion, Illinois does have a very narrow sales tax base, probably one of the, uh, one of the narrowest in the country. And so he's willing to look at some of those, and I'm interested to see what, uh, what proposals come out. We costed out them for the state of Illinois and issued a report last year that he has, as well as both sides. It was done by both parties. It's pretty objective. It shows what our surrounding states do and don't tax. So yes, it is under consideration. Yeah. Thank you. Any? Yes, sir. Uh, That's uh, Senator Menard's hometown. He's coming back. And, uh, if you're going to let the uh, state income tax go back down, how much in, in a drop in funding should we expect? Yeah. Now we really need to be at noon. Um, here's, you know, this is what, um, again, just kind of my own thoughts. I, I think the income tax is going to expire at the end of the year. There, there does not appear to be any. Uh, political suggestion that there's going to be a increase immediately. I think uh, for Governor Rauner and for all of us in the legislature, I think what would be best for us is to see early next year, the governor gives his budget address in February, I think what would be best uh, next year is for us to put forward a 60-day, a one-year, and a five-year plan for Illinois' finances. And I think as part of that plan, and again, I'm a downstater, um, we are particularly sensitive to uh, tax increases. I think there's many of us who want to see an improvement of the, the business environment uh, so that we can start to create some of the jobs that we need in Illinois to grow our economy. But realistically, as we approach next year, uh, what many of us realize is there's going to be, there will need to be some give and take, both sides. The give and take is that we absolutely need to do our part to reduce some of our spending, and I'm certain that revenues and additional revenues are going to be a part of that equation. And so long as we approach this in a, again, in a, in, in a piecemeal approach towards a big picture, 60-day plan, because you all, come January 1, want to know what we're going to do. So February, when we give the budget address, or when Governor Rauner gives his budget address, I think we need to talk about what the next 60 days looks like. Because we know the budget that we operate in today, it was a highly partisan budget, the, partisan, the budget we operate under today is a total, absolute failure. And we recognize that. So a 60-day, a one-year, and a five-year plan to address that, where we both give a little, we cut a little, we increase revenues a little, I think will put us on a, on a path to financial solvency that we're not on today. But how much do you think the allotment to the schools is going to go down? Well, look, I, mean, uh, I, I, I know you want a long-term plan, but we have a budget due in the summer to be made, and if I'm going to have 6% less next year, then I feel like it's impossible to know. I mean, look, look. you can listen to what everyone's saying. Governor Honor said he's going to pump more money into education. We will go through the process, and that process is designed for both parties to do whatever they might do. I hope they work together towards a solution that provides our school districts the funds that they need. But we've got to get there. I mean, we're in the situation that we're in today because of the decisions that were made last year. 
So before we start casting stones at one another, let's give the two parties an opportunity to work together under the new Rauner administration starting here in January. I'll just catch that stone that was cast. <laughs> um, in answer to your question, uh, this year's budget, which uh, Governor Quinn, when he presented his budget, presented two. One with extension of the tax, one without. I was one of the people that crafted that budget. Uh, you were looking at a, um, and our choice was looking forward that the tax was gonna be to expire. And so with that in mind, this budget reflects a loss of 1.2 billion. You were going to see a proration, I believe 75%, Chris? Uh, at 75%, uh, Will Davis, um, with agreement of the, uh, a lot of the members of the Education Committee, put an additional $80 million in to bring it back to the 89% of this year's proration, to leave that flat. What it does acknowledge is that layoffs will begin to happen in other areas, um, simply because you are set at last year's level and the others reflect a $1.2 billion drop in revenues because that's what's gonna happen. It also kept the other premise of paying down old bills. The way Will was able to put the $80 million in to elementary and secondary education is we took the monies that came in over our expected revenues and we prepaid employee health care and some of those items in order to give education the 80 million to bring it back to proration in case things went away. That's your answer. Uh, one last question. Yes, sir. Is, what is Senate Bill 16 doing to address that aspect so to ensure that the districts that are getting the money are handling their money well? One of the things, and I've got a number of districts in this room uh, that are in that same situation. One actually is sitting right behind you in, in Putnam County. So that's part of the Part of the reason the formulas aren't agreed to with it, and we're looking at addressing those inequities, but also what we asked Advance Illinois and Stands for Children and those groups who I rarely agree with, but they have some great financial and numbers people, is to come back in and cost out for us exactly what each of these 800 districts is receiving, state, federal, and local and what those dollars are being spent on. Uh, we were in the hearing with them just a few days ago and that assignment was given to them over a month ago um, to both of those groups to do two things. Cost out how the districts are spending their money and also arrive at a cost for mandates to be brought into the discussion. Um, the state board is doing one set of the numbers, stands and advance are doing the other set, so we can compare those. So in answer to your question, yes, we are looking at that before agreeing to any formulas which would redistribute. Well, you know, the Senate was working on that. I got my hands on it uh, when it came to the House, and that's why we didn't vote on it. So these are the unanswered questions, and as I said, in my district, I have 11 winners, or 11 losers and 12 winners, and that's why we're looking at those as well, and the gentleman sitting behind you is in exactly the same spot. So we do respect that. And I just want to make one additional comment on that. You know, it's this battle, too, between what you want the state to do and what you want local control to do. And we have to always remember to, to balance that. And, you know, there's at times we're like, no, state, you take responsibility. And at other times we said, we're elected board members. Let us do what we, we feel we need to do. So you have to take into consideration. You may be asking for that. Other districts do not like that. So these are all, you know, there's always, as, as we know in education here, there is always two sides, and they're very, opposing sides sometimes. So you always have to be careful. We always say you have to be careful what we wish for too. So that has definitely been talked about. You're not alone in that concern because I've heard that too. Look how they're spending their money. But remember too, um, local control. I mean, if we, if we believe in local control, we don't want to get our hands in it, in it too much. Thank you all very much. And please uh, join me in thanking the panel. You're watching the Illinois Channel. 
an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 